Good morning, church. It is a blessing to have you here with us this morning as we seek to worship the triune God of the Bible. If you're a visitor here this morning, we're so glad to have you. And if you're a member, it's a great blessing to be meeting with God's people this morning. I'm going to read for us this morning to start our time of worship, uh, Paul's encounter of Christ Jesus in the book of Revelation, starting in uh, verse 12, chapter 1. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands one, like the Son of Man, clothed with a long, with a, uh, with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. His hair, of his, the hair of his head, were white like wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last, the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning humbly, wanting to praise and worship the God of the Bible, wanting to bring glory and honor to your name. And Father, it is a great blessing to know that our good God truly holds the keys of death and Hades. And Father, you have sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross and overcome death. Father, we just praise you this morning that as we put our faith and our trust in Christ, we can have just great faith that we will be saved, that we too will not have to fear death. So, Father, we just ask this morning that as we worship, as we hear your word preached, as we sing together as one body in Christ, and as we pray to seek our God's answers, our, our supplication, and bring honor and glory to your name, Father, that you would renew our hearts and our minds this morning, that you would grow our faith this morning by the worship of you, by the hearing of your word, and that, Father, you would hold us securely in your Son, Jesus Christ. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing together. We're going to start by singing from the hymnal, number 136, O oh, four thousand tongues do sing.
Let's uh, pray together a prayer of confession as we prepare our hearts to take communion. Heavenly Father, we praise and thank you that you hear our prayers. And Father, we thank you that you have told us if we come and confess our sins to you in Christ, that, Father, they will be forgiven. And therefore, those who are in Christ, there is no condemnation. Father, we confess now that although we know Jesus Christ as our Savior, as the one who has reconciled us to a righteous God and who takes away the sins of our life, Father, we still continually go back to the things that we do not want to do, as Paul says. Father, we struggle with pride, with fearing man, with not fearing God, with the lust of the flesh, with the desire to steal and to covet. And Father, we love our sins sometimes and we hide and protect those sins. So we come to you now asking that you would give us hearts of confession, that you would give us humble hearts that seek to come and bow before you and confess all of our sin and turn away from them completely. But Father, we need your help to do this. We, in, our, in and of ourselves, would never turn away from our sin. We would continue on loving our sin and hating God. So Father, we pray now that you would do this for our church, that you would make us a people who confess their sin, who love the Lord our God. And Father, I pray for those this morning that are here hearing this prayer that have never come to any realization of their sin, who don't know their sin in any way. Father, give them this heart of confession now. Father, prick them and let them know the true sinfulness of their sin, how far it separates us from a righteous God. And Father, allow us as believers this morning also to know the same thing. Sometimes we do not understand the true sinfulness of our sin. We do not understand, Lord, how much you actually hate and despise sin and what it does to our relationship between God and our, and our souls. So Father, we just pray that you would continually turn us away from our sin. Give us hearts that want to seek after the things that you love, and not the things that our flesh desires. Father, we praise you now and thank you that you hear this prayer, that you forgive us from our sin when we confess again. Father, we thank you for this communion meal that we are about to partake together. This small piece of bread and cup of juice that just remind us and turn our hearts to our Savior, Jesus Christ. Remind us of the true sacrifice that was made on the cross once for all sin. And for those who confess their sin and put their faith in Christ, Father, Jesus' sacrifice is applied to our lives, to our souls, and our debt of sin is paid, and we are reconciled to the triune God. Father, we praise you and thank you for that this morning. And we ask that your blessing be upon this communion as we take it, and that the grace of this time of worship would be poured out on our hearts. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. I want to ask a few of the deacons to come up and help serve communion this morning. And if you are a visitor here this morning, we're glad you're here. But if you are not a believer in Jesus Christ yet, we're glad you're here to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. But we ask that you would just allow the cup and the juice to pass by because it has no bearing on you. But if you are a visitor this morning and you do know Jesus Christ, if you have put your faith and trust in him for the reconciliation of your sins to God, then we just, uh, we ask that, we, we invite you to take communion with us this morning. It is our tradition as you get the cup and the bread that you eat the bread as an individual uh, representation of your unity with Christ, and then you hold the cup and at the end we'll all drink together as the uh, representation of our unity as one body of believers with our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to read for us Paul's account of Jesus instituting the supper. The Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, 
And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We'll drink together. Amen. Amen.
scripture reading this morning is from the book of Acts, chapter 4, verses 1 through 12. Acts, chapter 4, verses 1 through 12. And as they, that is Peter and John, were speaking to the people, the priests, and the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas, the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, By what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders which, yeah, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Let us pray. Father, when the world or even those who are religious leaders, who may even call themselves Christians, get angry at our proclaiming of the resurrection of the dead in Jesus Christ, Lord, let us be bold as Peter and John were, and to preach your gospel, even to the point of imprisonment. Lord, no matter what emergency or law or decree that comes from the government, which would cease our preaching of, of Jesus, our crucified and resurrected Jesus, our only hope of salvation, Lord, let us be faithful and preach even through the trial, as Peter and John did. And Father, when we are called to give an account of why we insist on preaching your word and doing the deeds which you prepared in advance for us to do. Let us be bold and proclaim that it is in the name of Jesus that we preach, and it is for his kingdom that we work. Let us not fall into the trap of being vague in our defense, but to be clear and precise as Peter and John were before the high priest. And let us proclaim with all your other churches that salvation is found in no one else but Jesus, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Father, now I pray for the government officials and for the religious leaders of different religions and maybe even some who call themselves Christians who would haul us before courts and councils. Lord, I pray specifically for our local government, our city council, our mayor, our county council, our county executive, our state legislature, even our governor, Lord, these people who in the past few years have put themselves in the place of God and determining whether or not your people can gather for worship and proclaim your gospel in their churches. Lord, I pray that you would grant these people repentance, that you would have them turn from their wicked ways and that they would find forgiveness in the blood of Jesus. Lord, let not their souls be lost but let them also, along with the men who heard Peter and John and repented, Lord, let them repent of their sins as well. I pray that you would have them cling to Jesus for their forgiveness of their sins, to his perfect work for their righteousness alone. Father, would you will that you would save them, and not only save them, but you would sanctify them by the Holy Spirit, that you would um, sanctify them into putting forth and passing godly biblical laws and decrees in our land, and that they would confess 
with all your people, that salvation is found in no one else but in Jesus. And Lord, we pray that you would do these things for your glory, for your kingdom. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you open your Bibles to Luke chapter 11, sorry, Luke chapter 12, Luke chapter 12. We're going to look this morning at the first... 12 verses. Luke chapter 12, verses 1 through 12. Would you follow along as I read aloud? In the meantime, when so many thousands of the people had gathered together, they were trampling one another. He began to say to his disciples first, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Nothing is covered up that will not be revealed, or hidden that will not be known. Therefore, what, whatever you have said in the dark shall be heard in the light, and what you have whispered in private rooms shall be proclaimed on housetops. I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body, 
and after that have nothing more that they can do. But I will warn you whom to fear. Fear him who, after he is killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? And not one of them is forgotten before God. Why, even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, you are of more value than many sparrows. And I tell you, everyone who acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man also will acknowledge before the angels of God. But the one who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but the one who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. And when they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, Do not be anxious about how you should defend yourself or what you should say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word. Father, we tremble before your word because it is yours and is authoritative It is binding, and it pierces to our very hearts. Our Father, we ask this morning that you would give us understanding, but more so than just understanding, that you would use it by the power of your Spirit to conform our hearts and our minds into the image of our Savior, in whose name we pray this morning. Amen. Our passage this morning starts out in a very interesting way. Perhaps uh, you, well, I don't know, if you chuckle a little bit or, uh, you know, immediately Luke says, in the meantime, when so many thousands of the people had gathered together that they were trampling one another. What an interesting statement, the way that Luke opens his passage. Apparently, Jesus in his ministry, his miracles and his teaching had been gathering such a crowd that they were quite literally running each other over to get close to Jesus, to be near him, to hear what he might say, to see what he might do. And we've seen this. He's he's had to feed the the people, 5,000 men plus women and children. He's kind of accrued for himself this gaggle of people who are coming after, wanting to, to be close to Jesus, to get just a little bit of feel for what he's doing. It's the setting we find ourselves in. But notice how Luke clarifies Jesus' intent immediately. The people were trampling one another, but Jesus, that's he, began to say to his disciples first. Intriguing. Jesus, now that he has his face set toward Jerusalem, no longer is speaking to the crowds at large. He's no longer broadcasting his message to to everyone. But he's narrowing, he's focusing the things that he's saying to his true disciples. To those who, who not only want to be near Jesus because of the cool things that he can do for them and the cool things that he's going to say, but they truly desire him. Remember, it's not that long ago where Jesus commended Mary for simply wanting to sit at his feet and commune with him and love him and, and, and be near him, desire him with everything that she has. Luke is clarifying for us in that moment who Jesus' true disciples are. And here, Jesus speaks directly to them. He, he, doesn't, he no longer is speaking to the mass of people who are just coming after him for the things that he can do. But he's speaking to those who have ears to hear. Remember, this is the great dividing line. You're either with him or against him. And Jesus knows that there's a whole lot of people who are actually against him, but who might seem like they're for him because they're just coming after, following. But those who have ears to hear, but Jesus is speaking to them. And, and, and the, his true disciples, again, 
want to listen to the things that he has to say. Remember, Peter says in John 6, we, we referenced this a couple of weeks ago, Jesus, uh, Peter says, as everyone else had kind of been abandoning Jesus, Peter says, where else should we go? Because you have the words of life. The true disciples of Jesus recognize that Jesus alone has the words of life and they're hanging on every word that he has to say. And so Jesus focuses now in speaking to them. Of course, what does he say? Well, this morning we're going to look at three different types of hypocrisy. Three different types of hypocrisy. First, we're going to see legalistic hypocrisy. Legalistic hypocrisy. Then we'll look at theological hypocrisy. And finally, we'll look at confessional hypocrisy. That is the theme this morning, hypocrisy. And notice immediately what Jesus says. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Last week, we looked at uh, an extended passage where Jesus highlights the Pharisees and the lawyers who were appearing one way, and yet inside, very much the opposite. They appeared light on the outside, but inside, they were all darkness. They, on the outside, they appeared clean and shiny, but on the inside, they were just filthy, dirty rags. Jesus highlighted them in a number of ways. And here, when he's speaking directly to his followers, his true disciples, he just doesn't, doesn't, doesn't hold back anymore. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. What is hypocrisy? Well, the word, we get our English word directly from the Greek word, hypocrisis, which in that context was used a lot for play actors. People on a stage who would put on a mask and get out on stage and play a part that wasn't actually who they were. That was a common usage of that word, hypocrisis, Being one thing for show, but in reality, you're something very different. And Jesus says the, the Pharisees, this, the way that they act is show acting. They're just actors. They want you to, to, to see them in a certain way, in a certain light. They want to appear something that they're not in reality. Beware of that. They appeared outwardly good, but inside they were filthy. Again, we looked at that last week. Well, why were they doing this? Why were the Pharisees appearing one thing on the outside, but in reality something very different on the inside? And their motivations in life are consumed with what others think. That's why the Pharisees acted the way they did. They were consumed that everyone else around them would think of them in a certain way. That's why hypocrites do what hypocrites do. is because they want to appear a certain way to other people. Their motivations are about other people and caring what other people think. And that's what the Pharisees acted like. They cared and were consumed with what other people thought about them. I don't think we're often different from that, are we? we? We live in a culture who's immensely consumed with what everyone else thinks about us. I mean, just open Twitter or Facebook or Instagram, and that's all that is, is you post stuff because you want other people to see you in a certain light. There's a there's some goodness in social media, but that is the real danger. And we are seeing that more and more as our culture just degenerates more and more. Even secular culture is understanding the absolute crap that you find on social media. There's just no other way to say it. And, and the effect that that's having. People post stuff because they want other people to see them in a certain way. And there's study after study showing that this has devastating effects on young teenage girls who, who see their friend post the selfie and they, they oh man, they look, they're doing all this and they're going to this party and they look a certain way and they feel bad and shame about themselves. And so what do they do? They try to clean themselves up on the outside so that everyone else sees them that same way. And it's just death inside. That's all this is and our culture is full of this. And it's easy for us to fall into the same trap. To be so consumed with what everyone else thinks about us. 
that we, that we change everything about ourselves on the outside because we want to be accepted. But notice what Jesus actually calls this. He says, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Leaven, that, that thing you put in a dough of bread that makes it grow. And, and you just put a little spot in it, and you, you, you knead it through the dough, and, and it, it infiltrates the entire batch of dough. And the entire batch of dough grows. If you were an Israelite who was doing the Passover, well, leaven was the worst possible thing because it, Passover was the feast of unleavened bread. So the audience would have been immediately horrified. Leaven, I don't want that. If I want to have a good relationship with God, I, I don't want leaven. It infects everything that, that, that you are. That's what Jesus is saying. This hypocrisy is, is leaven. It, it infects the entirety of the person. Everything then about you becomes consumed with what other people think. It starts defining who you are, how you present yourself. And not only does it affect the entirety of an individual, but it spreads. Paul uses the same imagery and terminology in 1 Corinthians to say that sin is like leaven and that it, it infects the entire church body. And so the leaven of hypocrisy doesn't just come after us. If, if we're busy trying to appear a certain way, we are merely creating a culture where everyone else thinks that they have to appear a certain way too. We are encouraging that in our brothers and sisters in Christ. We are leading them into sin by trying to put on a show for everyone else. That's what the Pharisees did. They wanted the show, and they wanted to say, look at me, and it infected and killed the entire generation. Jesus, we looked last week, condemns the entire generation that rejected him. And it was because the Pharisees had done so. And the leaven of the Pharisees, their rebellion against God and their, their hypocrisy had infected the rest of the generation and how they viewed themselves. It's leaven. It spreads. It's, it's an arms race. Who can look best? Brothers and sisters, we're not immune to this. And notice what Jesus' promise is immediately next. Nothing, in verse 2, is covered up that will not be revealed. Jesus gives a promise. This leaven, this hypocrisy of the Pharisees, it's going to be uncovered. It's going gonna, it's gonna to come to the light. It's going to be exposed, Jesus said. Eventually, eventually. One of the things that we often know is that hypocrisy doesn't always get exposed in this life. Sometimes we have to be content knowing that hypocrisy only gets exposed at the judgment seat of Christ. There will be men and women who make it through the entirety of this life being one thing on the outside and yet being something else very differently on the inside, being filthy on the inside. But Jesus says, no, don't, don't fear. It, it will be exposed. That's a promise Jesus is giving us. And so it's a promise to, to his disciples, take heart, that hypocrisy will be exposed, but also be warned, your hypocrisy will be exposed. Brothers and sisters, we, we also go to the judgment seat of Christ and what we are on the inside will be exposed. We can sit here and come to church every Sunday morning and think that we have an outward show of things and that God will accept us and that the body of Christ will accept us because of the show of things. But our inner self, our, our heart, will be exposed as we stand before Christ. It's a stern warning as well. It won't always be in this life. Kids, the first question on your bulletin says, does God's promise of uncovering hypocrisy always come in this life? This is a good lesson for us kids, for kids to learn. Will it always be exposed in this life? The answer, no. No, it won't. But it will come at the final judgment. It will come at the final judgment. This is legalistic hypocrisy. And that leads 
to theological hypocrisy. Legalistic hypocrisy leads to theological hypocrisy. Notice where Jesus immediately goes in verse 4. I tell you, my friends, again, my friends. Jesus is talking to his, his followers, his true disciples. Do not fear those who kill the body and after that have nothing more that they can do. But I warn you whom to fear. Fear him who, has, who after he is killed has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? And not one of them is forgotten before God, why even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, you are of more value than many sparrows. He's warning his followers of theological hypocrisy. What do I, what do I mean by that? Well, theological hypocrisy is believing one thing about God, but acting very differently. Acting in a way contrary to that which you believe. Notice, Jesus is warning them against that very thing. He, he, he reminds them of the theological truth that they're supposed to know, that God is the final judge. They're supposed to know that, and that God loves them and cares for them and protects them, are, are not sparrows. They're, they're, they're worth nothing. And yet God cares for them. God knows the very number of the hairs on your head. Jesus is reminding them of theology, of things that are true about God himself that his followers should know. And yet notice what he's pointing out. We know this. We know this about God. And yet it's easy for us to forget that in the way that we live our life. Because what does he point out? We fear those who kill the body. We, we, we act and we live in such a way where we fear everyone else. We again, are consumed with what everyone else is thinking about us, and we live our lives in such a way that it actually betrays the theology that we say to profess. If we're fearful of what everyone else may think about us, and, and if, if we are fearful that they may actually even kill us, well, we're, we're living in a way that's contrary to the truth that we profess, that no, God is the final judge, and they could kill the body, but I don't care about that because there's a greater judgment, there's a greater death that is awaiting those who reject Christ. That's the, the theological truth. So why would I be afraid of them? When, when God is the judge, and not only is God the judge who will be the final arbiter one day, but also in this life, he cares for me. He, he knows me. He knows me better. I don't, I don't know how many hairs I have on my head. All I know is when Merck cuts it, there's a whole bunch on the ground. But I can't, I don't count them. I don't know these things. But oh, God does. God knows it. And he cares. He loves. He protects. And even if they do kill the body, it doesn't matter because God's the judge. That's the truth that we should know. But Jesus is warning us against living in a way that betrays that truth. When we walk around caring what everyone else thinks about us, it's theological hypocrisy. We sit here each and every Sunday and worship God and cling to the gospel of Jesus Christ, but walk out the door and then determine our lives by the way in which everyone else thinks about us and what everyone else says our lives should look like and what everyone else says should be our priorities. We no longer are caring what God thinks, but what they think. That's theological hypocrisy. There's different ways that we do that, right? We make theological compromises. We change how we think about Scripture because of what society tells us. We even reinterpret Scripture because society says certain things, whether it be scientifically, you can come talk to me afterwards, ethics, morals, laws, what is good and right, what is the normal natural human experience. There are 
churches, there are believers, there are pastors who change the way they view scripture and change what scripture actually says. Well, they don't change it, but they teach something different, contrary to scripture, because they're getting their cues from the world around them, because they want to fit in. They're afraid that the culture around them might look at them differently and might harass them, might take away their tax-exempt status. Oh, that hits a church where it matters, doesn't it? Oh, don't take away my tax-exempt status. That's caring far more about what the world around us thinks. Oh, woe to the church who changes its convictions because of what society thinks and what society tells them they should believe. Theological compromise. There's also theological hypocrisy when we trust our own intuition, when we trust our own ideas about what is good and what is right. Not just, not just societies telling us what things are, but, but when we trust ourselves first and foremost. When we, when we trust our own ability to figure things out, and when we trust our own ability to rightly determine things. When, for example, we go out to spread the gospel, and, you know, we talk about the love of Jesus because we think that's going to win people for Christ, but we don't actually give them the context for the love of Jesus, which is that you're under judgment because you're a sinner. But, but they don't want to hear that. I make a theological compromise. I, I, I make a practical compromise. I'm a theological hypocrite when I don't give the gospel because I'm afraid they might just not accept it. Or, or how we think about church and what's good and right in church and how churches should grow. We trust our own intuition, our own ability to figure it out. We, And why do we do this? Why do we do this? Well, one, it, it can be very indicative of a heart of unbelief. Maybe we don't actually believe what God says and that God is true. Maybe we don't actually have the theological conviction. But maybe we, we in those moments, care far more about what everyone else thinks rather than what God thinks. Kids, the second question on your bulletin. What are we forgetting when we are afraid of other people's opinions of us? What are we afraid of? Or what are we forgetting when we are afraid of other people's opinions of us? The answer, we forget that God is the final judge. We forget that God is the final judge. He's the one that, that we have to answer to. Not, not ultimately the government, not ultimately uh, anything else, society's opinions. It's God. And this theological hypocrisy, this, you know, acting differently, uh, contrary to your theological assertions based on what everyone else thinks, well, that leads to confessional hypocrisy. That leads to confessional hypocrisy. What does Jesus say in verse 8? And I tell you, everyone who acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man also will acknowledge before the angels of God. But the one who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. You see, when we start down the path of legalistic hypocrisy, just trying to put on a good show, and then we get to theological hypocrisy where we we kind of lose our theological convictions based on what everyone thinks about us. There's only one step beyond that. We, we realm into confessional hypocrisy. We deny Christ before men. We deny Christ. We no longer would even call ourselves a Christian, perhaps. It's a serious offense. Jesus says there are serious consequences. You deny Christ before men. You get to that point where somebody says, are you a Christian? And you say, no. Nah. Do you love Christ? No. Nah. It's not me. 
you get to that point, Jesus says, when you get to that final judgment seat, when you stand before Christ and God looks at you and says, why, why do you get to come into heaven? Christ will not answer for you. He will be silent before the Father. For those of us who confess Christ before men, in that moment, Christ says, he's mine. I bought him. I died for him. But for those of us who deny Christ, who get to the Father, and he says, why do I let you in? But we've spent our entire life denying Jesus Christ. Christ remains silent. His blood doesn't cover, cover that. It's a stern warning. It's a stern warning. There are very real consequences to denying Jesus Christ before man. We aren't covered by his blood. There's something I want us to notice. We'll, we'll address this because there's a tension here that you might be feeling. But we'll, we'll get back to that. But I want us to notice, first of all, that... Suffering will happen to the people of God. Notice verse 11. And when they bring you before the synagogues. It doesn't say if. He says when. It's going to happen. We, Edward read for us Acts chapter 4. It happens immediately in the New Testament. Christ ascends. Pentecost comes. They go out and preach. Boom. They're drugged before the synagogue and the rulers. It's going to happen. Persecution for the name of Christ will happen. Brothers and sisters, we've generally had it pretty easy in our country, haven't we? We, we don't often think about persecution. What is that? Martyrdom, dying for the name of Christ, getting thrown in jail for the name of, name of Christ. We've had it really easy. And in fact, our experience isn't the norm throughout church history. By and large, you actually confess the gospel, the true gospel. You're put to death for it. Ask the reformers. Ask millions of people around the world who are being put to death and imprisoned for the name of Jesus Christ. We will suffer. And, and we have to preach this and be reminded of this because it's coming. I'm, I'm convinced of this, that it's coming. It's, it wasn't that long ago that we were praying for a pastor in Canada who was put in jail because he gathered his church for worship on Sunday morning. Canada, our, our, our northern neighbor. It's not just up there. It's here. Churches in our very own country were fined for gathering together and holding to the conviction of the gospel and of the word of God. It's coming. Gird your loins. Well, I, we need to prepare. We need to actually mentally prepare for this fact because we've had it so easy. And, and it, it might scare us a little bit to think of those those facts, because we love our, our nice, easy, comfortable lives. Jesus hasn't let us love our comfortable lives so far in the gospel. We've seen that, and we're going to see it again. But if we hold on to the things of this world, well, then when society comes and tries to take it away, we're going we're gonna to want to deny, and we're going to want to say, maybe I'm, not, maybe I'm not a Christian. We've got to prepare ourselves mentally for it, that it's coming. Because holding to the truth of God's word is more and more bringing us in direct, into direct conflict with our culture. We know this. We know this. So how do, how do we keep from denying Christ? In that moment, when they drag you to the synagogue, when they drag you to the courts, when they persecute you, when they When they, when they threaten your very life, how in that moment do we keep from denying Jesus Christ? 
Well, what does Jesus say in verse 12? For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. Brothers and sisters, Jesus promises us very real help in our time of need. In that moment, he promises his very real help, his spirit. I want to read from you. This was uh, in the account that John Knox wrote of the Reformation in England. And if you remember your history, Mary Tudor reverted the entire island of kind of Great Britain back to Catholicism. And the Protestants who confessed the true gospel were being put to death. She was called Bloody Mary for a reason, because she killed Christian after Christian after Christian for confessing the name of Christ. And John Knox writes this about one of the accounts of a Scottish Christian. Uh, says this, his name was Kennedy. As he's being put to death, Knox says, Kennedy at that first was faint and gladly would have recanted. He feared this man did. But Knox continues, but while that place of repentance was denied unto him, the Spirit of God, which is the Spirit of all comfort, began to work into him. Yea, the inward comfort began to burst forth, both in visage as in tongue and word, for his countenance began to be cheerful, and with a joyful voice upon his knees he said, O eternal God, how wondrous is that love and mercy that thou bearest unto mankind, and unto me, the most cative and miserable wretch above all others. For even now, when I would have denied thee and thy Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, my only Savior, and so have cast myself into everlasting damnation, Thou, by thine own hand, hast pulled me from the very bottom of hell and makes me to feel that heavenly comfort which takes from me that ungodly fear wherewith before I was oppressed. Now I defy death. Do what you please. I praise my God. I am ready. The Holy Spirit is a very real help in our time of need. I shudder when I read that account because it makes it perhaps a bit more real. So the Spirit helps us. But how does the Spirit actually do that? How does the Spirit actually embolden our hearts? Well, He, he grounds us in the theology that we know to be true. Notice, and that as the man, as Kennedy prayed, the Holy Spirit grounded him in the truth of who God is, reminded him of it, comforted and strengthened his soul in the, the truth that he knew. The Spirit uses means to feed us in that moment. And, and I'll, I'll call them the three S's of biblical truth. The Spirit uses the three S's of biblical truth. One, Scripture itself. And, and, and we've talked about this again and again, that Scripture and the Spirit are intricately tied together. You, they're, they're a package deal. You want to understand Scripture? It's the Spirit who enables you to understand Scripture. But what is the Scripture? What does the Spirit actually use to feed us and to encourage our hearts? He uses Scripture. He brings the word of God to our minds in that moment of need, in that moment when they put us to death and they persecute us and they throw us in jail. What is it that the Spirit is going to bring to our minds? It's the word of God. There's nothing else that we would need in that moment except the word of God. And you see this actually all throughout Scripture. Go to the Psalms. Go to David. When David was, was being persecuted and running for his life. He's quoting scripture. He's quoting what God says about himself. The Lord, the Lord of God, merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. It's the words of scripture that come to his mind. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. 
It's the scriptures that the Spirit uses. It's the sacraments that the, that the Spirit uses. We, we partook of one this morning, the Lord's Supper. How does, how does the Spirit build and strengthen our faith? It's because we are reminded of the truth of the gospel, that our Savior was put to death to reconcile us to God. Why do I not need not fear to stand before the judgment seat of Christ? Why is death just one more step in my journey towards heaven? Because I know what Christ has done for me. And I'm reminded of it. Each and every Sunday morning as I eat the bread and as I drink the cup, my spirit and my soul are edified and strengthened. We, we baptize. S scripture commands us to the other sacrament is baptism. And we do that as a public proclamation. It's why the Bible commands us to do it, because Jesus commands us to publicly tie ourselves to Jesus Christ. Right? That's what baptism is. It's a public profession of what has already happened in, in inwardly, that we've died with Christ, we go under the water, and we've been raised again to new life. We come out. And we do that at, right after we're converted as a public profession of that. But then our baptism is something that we can always return to again and again and again in our minds. Yes, I've died with Christ and been raised to new life, and I will be with him one day in heaven. Even if they slay me, I will be with him because I've publicly identified with him. What an encouraging thing that is. Oh, if we, brothers and sisters, if you, if you are weighed down with sin and you doubt your salvation, Remember your baptism if you were baptized. Remember the public profession that you've identified yourself with Jesus Christ. The Spirit will use that to feed your soul in your hour of need. Scripture, sacrament, and song is the third S. Scripture, sacrament, and song was having a writer's block yesterday as I was preparing my sermon and walking around, sitting there with my head down. And I just walked out to the piano, started playing before the throne of God above and started singing it. Writer's block broken. There's something unique about singing, isn't there? That's why I would argue a lot of churches idolize it in perhaps an unhealthy way because it has the unique ability to stir our souls. And we want to be careful of that in corporate worship because we want our souls to be stirred by the gospel and not merely by a beautiful melody. But beautiful melodies have a way of doing that. But the truth that we sing is vitally important. And the melody that we put it to helps bring it to our minds. Perhaps you, if we sing a song that you really like, on a Sunday morning, you go home, that afternoon it's just in your head, and you're thinking it, and you're singing of it, singing it. Songs have a way of kind of becoming part of who we are, and we grasp at those things. And, and there's account after account, if you read the book of, uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs, or, or, or any accounts of, of men and women being put to death for Christ, and a lot of them break out into song. As the flames, as they're put on the stake and the flames are coming up around them, they're singing. It's, it's why we care about the songs that we sing and we, do, we try to be really intentional. We don't do that just because we like theological precision. We do. We like theological precision. But because we know that the songs get stuck in your head and, and that's the truth that is going to come to your mind in your moment of need. If we're filling your heads on Sunday mornings with WGTS and just watered down, yeah. That, and when you're put to the test, that's what's going to come out. But oh, if your minds are filled with lyrics like, one with himself I cannot die. My soul is purchased by his blood. My life is hid with Christ on high with Christ my Savior and my God. If that's the songs and the words that are in your head, or, or this, be still my soul, the Lord is on thy side. Bear patiently the, 
the curse of grief or pain. Leave to thy God to order and provide. In every change, he faithful will remain. Be still my soul, thy best, thy heavenly friend, through thorny ways leads to a joyful end. Or, or this, Christ is mine forevermore. Hazel Goldsworthy's favorite song, bless her. Mine are days here as a stranger, pilgrim on a narrow way. One with Christ, I will encounter harm and hatred for his name. But mine is armor for the battle, strong enough to last the war. And he has said he will deliver safely to the golden shore. We sing these songs in church because the Spirit will take the truth that we sing. And in your moment of greatest need, Scripture, sacrament, and song is how he will build your soul and how he will strengthen you and fortify your faith no matter what they do to me. Him I will never deny. And all of them, all of them bring you back to the gospel, don't they? They all bring us back to Jesus Christ who himself faced the greatest of persecution, though he was innocent, who himself bore our sin and the wrath of God upon himself. That's who they take us back to. That's who they hold us to. They remind us that we, by faith, are united to Christ. That's, that's ultimately the difference if we've been united to Jesus Christ, if his blood covers us, then we will not deny him. That's, that's the truth of it. We will not deny him if that is the Savior that we cling to because we cling to our Savior. We are united to our Savior and we won't deny him. Kids, the third question. This is weighty for adults, but kids feel the pain too. And kids, it's going to be worse for you than it was for me. So, what should we remember when other people don't like us because we're Christians? What should we remember when other people don't like us because we say we're Christians? We should remember that Jesus walked this path and he will bring us safely home. Let's pray. Let's pray together. Father, we ask that you would take your word and plant it deeply within us Lord, we pray that you will allow us to make the good confession before any who may ask, no matter what the costs are. And Father, we pray that now you would plant it in us by the preaching of your word, by the singing of godly, God-glorifying songs, and by the sacraments that you have given us. Take these things and use them to edify us, to build us up, to prepare us for what you have laid out for us to do. Lord, we pray that we would not be infected by hypocrisy, that our confessions would be true and pure, not just shows for men, but a pure conscience pure confessions that glorify your name, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. We stand together and sing hymn 506 in Christ alone.
Just a few announcements this morning. If you've been wondering to yourself when our next member meeting was going to be, I have good news. It's today. (laughs) So immediately after church, we have a membership uh, fellowship meal. If you're a visitor here today and you want to join us to have lunch with us, we'd love to have you uh, join us and fellowship with us together. And then immediately following that, we'll have a members meeting, uh, regular quarterly member business meeting. Uh, Because of the member meeting today, there's no evening service tonight, so if you're here, you'll be here by yourself. And then uh, next Saturday is our annual fall festival, Saturday, November 5th, 1 to 5 uh, p.m. It's going to be a chili cook-off, fun games, activities. If you have questions, you want to help, come see Matt and Colleen Dobbins. They are kind of overseeing and organizing everything, and also thank them and pray for them for that. All right, if you'd stand this morning for the benediction. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen.